Hello, Bill Molino here with Bill's War Game World, and I am here at Jerusalem Mills, and Goober the Traveling Bear is accompanying me, and we're at the Harry Gilmore's Raid interview site for today. We're going to be interviewing Mr. Glenn the Historian here at the uh, General Store, and the Gilmore Raid happened during the 1864 early campaign to try to take Washington, D.C. And here is our the line of route that they took. Um, there's Westminster. We've done a video there at Union Mills. And the Reisterstown. And the map here is You Are Here. So, this is the introduction. Um, I hope you'll watch the entire video. I'm sure we'll learn a lot about the raid and um, stay tuned. Hello, Bill Molino here. We are now in the general store at Jerusalem Mills and Goober is here to listen to Mr. Glenn, the historian for Jerusalem Mills. He knows a little bit about everything and Mr. Glenn, will you take it away? What are we doing today? Uh, well, I'm going to talk to Goober a little bit about the raid of Harry Gilmore, which took place in 1864. And I'm just going to basically give you an overview of what happened. A lot of people like to get into greater detail. I've got some books here that have given us information over the time. The Confederates' Last Northern Offensive up the line, and Jubal Early's raid on Washington. Probably the best sources, though, are Harry Gilmore's own book, Four Years in the Saddle, and Dan Toomey's The Johnson Gilmore Raid. This is one that you can purchase here on site, which gives the details of the 1864 raid. And also another good source is the Civil War Trails map, the attack on Washington. Even though we're in Harford County, Maryland, the basis of this story starts with Drew Borley's raid on Washington, D.C. in 1864. It was sort of a last attempt by the Confederates to put pressure on the Union so that they might let the South go away. There was really no chance of them really defeating the Union, but maybe they could be left alone if they threatened Washington. So in 1864, Jubal Early came out of Shenandoah Valley through Frederick, heading for Washington, D.C. Garrett, the owner of the Boulder, Baltimore, Ohio Railroad, sent word back to Lew Wallace in Baltimore that Confederate troops were coming in large numbers. So Lou Wallace gathered up some men from Baltimore area, took the train out to Frederick, and his plan was not to defeat the Confederates because there were too many, but to slow them down. They knew the goal of Jubal Early was to attack Washington, D.C. And what Wallace wanted to do was slow him up for a day or two so that reinforcements from the Petersburg, Richmond area could be sent to Washington. He was successful in doing this. This is July 1864. As part of Jubal Early's plan, he sent a detachment of troops under General Johnson and Major Gilmore to go east. They were to disrupt communication and transportation, which back then meant cutting the telegraph wires and ripping up train tracks. Johnson and Gilmore moved from the Frederick area through Westminster and eventually ended up in Cockeysville in Baltimore County, what we would call Hunt Valley today, that area. The North Central Railroad was there. They ripped up the tracks. They cut the telegraph wires. And then the two men's, uh, two men's uh, detachments separated. Johnson headed south. His goal was to free Confederate prisoners at Point Lookout. 
He only got as far as Beltsville in Maryland, and that part of the raid was called off. Gilmore struck out east from Cockeysville with the goal of disrupting, as I said, communication transportation. But along the way, he wanted to stop and visit his family, where current day Lock Raven Dam is, was the Gilmore home. It was called Glen Ellen or the castle. We have uh, a photograph of it. Okay. There's nothing now but ruins. Uh, but if you walk back the trail, you can still find where it was. And the Gilmore home, the land for the Gilmore home was a gift from the Ridgely family that owned Hampton Mansion. Uh, both the Ridgeleys and the Gilmores were Confederate sympathizers and had run into trouble on and off in the early 19, uh, 1860s uh, for their activities. But the Risleys had gifted the Gilmore family 300 acres and they built their home there. And throughout his childhood, Gilmore had played with the Risley children at Hampton Mansion. But on his way, he, as I say, he stopped to visit with his family. And then he wanted to continue on his journey. The evening of July 10th, Gilmore's troops uh, spent the night at the Price Farm near Glenarm. It's the present site of the Bordy Vineyard. Okay. So that's a, a, a nice stop and you can say you're doing historical <laughs> research. Uh, but they camped there that night and before they camped that night, uh, Gilmore had sent a detachment of troops to get fresh horses from the area, Moncton, Glen Arm, Bel Air area. So some troops scattered out and they tried to round up some fresh horses. Mr. Glenn, how many men did he have right in his command at this point? Approximately 130. Uh, and he didn't lose anybody on his whole expedition, which was kind of unusual in his way since he was so deep in enemy territory. So. Those troops scattered and then came back on modern day Mountain Road, 152, what's called, a, there's a stone building there called the Stagecoach House and those troops stayed there that night of July 10th. Gilmore and his main force were still over at the Price Farm. The next morning, the troops that were at the stagecoach house came into Jerusalem Village, raided the mill, flour mill, grist mill, and the store that we're sitting in. Uh, at the store, they took uh, clothing, shoes, uh, and we know that because uh, there was an article in the Baltimore Sun paper, which I know you can't read, but we do have copies of it. That That's can. cool. Uh, which talk about the raid and, and what they requisitioned. Uh, Borrowed. In, right. In the, in the article, they said they took, that the Confederates took horses. In Gilmore's uh, autobiography, he said he would never steal horses. So, as in a lot of cases of history, there's a couple different versions of what happened, which happens several times in the story of the local raid here. While the raid was going on here, Gilmore and his main force left the Price Farm and came through Fork, Maryland, down Sunshine Avenue. For those of you that come to visit the site, these are all within a couple minutes of the village. Uh, on his way, they, the two lead scouts, Ishmael Day and another scout, passed the farm of Ishmael Day. Uh, Ishmael Day had hung out a 35-star Union flag knowing that the Confederates were in the area. He must have been some kind of agitator or looking for trouble, and he found it. The two Confederates came up to his farm and asked him to take the flag down. Probably didn't say please when they did it. Ishmael Day inside his house 
felt pretty safe. He had his shotgun leaning against the wall, so he used it to wound Sergeant Fields. The other, as far as I know, unnamed scout took off to return to the main body. Ishmael Day was in his house and he could see, because the troops weren't far away, that the rest of the Confederates, approximately 130, were coming his way. So he ran. He left behind his farm, his house, his barn, and his wife. I don't know if that's the order that he valued them, but that's <laughs> who he left behind. The Confederates came up, burned the barn, burned the house, never could find Ishmael Day, and did nothing to his wife, because in the time of the Civil War, that would have been an ungentlemanly thing to do, at least according to Harry Gilmore. Now, Ishmael Day had suffered a great loss, and after Gilmore's men had left the area, he went to Lou Wallace in Baltimore and asked for some money for the damages that he suffered. And Lou Wallace said that would be no problem. He simply took out a map, drew a five-mile circumference circle around where Ishmael Day lived, and said all the Confederate sympathizers within that area would pay for his new barn and his new house. And by the following spring, he had both. So it shows that there was a split in this area between Union sympathizers and Southern sympathizers. Sergeant Fields was taken back to Fork. There was a, a hotel there where he was cared for. Today it's uh, a veterinary hospital. If you drive through Fork, you can get a feel for where it was. And he did eventually pass away. But the troops marched on and joined up with the few that had raided the village earlier in the day. And they went to what is now current day uh, Joppa Town, but was called Magnolia Station back then. But if you go to Joppa Town today and go to the, the end of Joppa Town toward the water, there's a uh, a trail, a nature trail, and if you get on that nature trail at the park and go to the end, you'll come to a very nice spot with picnic tables that overlooks the Gunpowder River and the railroad bridge that goes over the Gunpowder River. And this is where Gilmore was headed. When he got there, he stopped a train. Uh, the first train he stopped, the engineer was a little too clever for him, and he, in some way, fixed the train so it couldn't be moved which thwarted uh, Gilmore's plan. But the second train, he was able to stop. It was a passenger train. He got the passengers off the train. As he said in his autobiography, he walked them back to the baggage car, made sure everyone had their own baggage, provided a little skiff for them to cross the Gunpowder River to continue their journey north. And he did this all the while, Delaware militia were on the other side of the Gunpowder River shooting at its men. He then set the train on fire on the bridge and train and bridge collapsed. The Gunpowder Bridge, which was part of the Philadelphia, Wilmington, Baltimore Railroad, was the only link north of Baltimore to Philadelphia, New York, in other words, a source of supply and reinforcements. So this was a major blow to the Union. And we know this for a couple reasons. One, we saw the little article from the Sun paper, but there was a much larger article we have back here in the New York Times from July of 1865. Okay. Talking about the raid that Gilmore made and the fact that the railroad was cut and there was no longer transportation opportunities for troops and supplies to come north. So this was a major event. In fact, just about the entire front page of the New York Times covers that article of the railroad bridge and so forth. Another 
example of a different version of Gilmore had said how he took such great care with the passengers. In this article, people are quoted of having their wallets stolen, other valuables taken as Gilmore's men helped them get their baggage. So again, a couple different versions. Probably the truth is somewhere in between. Also on the train, there was a Union General Franklin, and even though this was late in the war, he was home on leave in civilian clothes. But one of the Southern sympathizers, a lady on the train, said that he was there, and they asked him to, they gave a description of what car he was on, who he was, and so Gilmore was able to capture him, take him off the train along with some other people more or less as hostages or perhaps for later prisoner exchanges. At this time, Gilmore starts heading back west to join up with Johnson and get back to Drupal early because the raid on Washington had basically failed. They had gotten as far as the city to Fort Stevens, which was a, one of the the series of forts that was out surrounding the defenses of, of Washington, D.C. They did draw an interesting spectator then because uh, Abraham Lincoln was in a summer cottage and rather than be taken back to visit or protection of his capital and the, and the troops there, he wanted to go out and see the Confederates, so he went out to Fort Stevens to view the Confederates, except he made himself a very conspicuous target. He wore his top hat that we're so used to seeing with him and so people could recognize him and he was shot at during the time, but uh, no problem. He eventually got back to safety. Gilmore, on the other hand, has have been going now for over close to 24 hours and he needed to get out of the area. When he left our area, he went back to Towson on his way west. At Towson, he stopped at uh, 80's Hotel. Some of the, the hotel's not standing, uh, but I know up until a few years ago, 80's Bar was still there, and that's where Gilmore stopped for refreshments and talked in some bravado about riding through the streets of Baltimore and just shooting his guns off, not to capture the city, but just to scare everybody and let them know the Confederates were in the area. He was talked out of that because he, the, he was told that the militia in the area had been notified, activated, and they were waiting for him if he was to do something that reckless. So from there he went and headed toward uh, present-day racers town. He spent the night there, uh, and it was at that time that General Franklin made his escape from Gilmore's forces. Franklin's version was that they put him in a tent for the night, but he had hidden a knife in his boot he slit the tent, snuck out the back, stole the horse, and made good his escape. Gilmore's version was when he came to the camp, the men were spread out, they're not all in one big bunch traveling this way. When he got to the camp, the men he had put in charge of guarding Franklin were all asleep. And so he had to wake them up and they found that Franklin was gone. He didn't say anything about a tent being split. So again, a couple different versions. But Franklin was gone. Now, they spent the night there. The next day, Gilmore tried to send some of his men to blow up what was the Pikesville Armory. You know, weapons were stored there and, and powder and so forth. But when they got there, they were talked out of it by a local resident who said that it would cause more problems for the Southern sympathizers because they knew Gilmore was leaving. It wasn't like, you know, he was going to be able to protect him. So, the army was left alone. And ironically, 
20 years after the Civil War was over, the armory became the home for Confederate soldiers, indigent Confederate soldiers, so it was placed in so it's a little irony there that they didn't blow it up and it became a home for Confederate soldiers in the end. So Gilmore made his return to Johnson and then to Drew Borley and they withdrew and that was really the, the last big attempt by the South to invade the North. At the end of all this taking place, uh, Robert E. Lee wrote a, a summary of what had happened and in there, he says that the only person that did everything he was supposed to do as he was ordered was Harry Gilmore. He disrupted the tele uh, telegraph wires, cut them wherever he went, disrupted the North Central Railroad, which was a link just between Maryland and Central Pennsylvania, and then the Philadelphia, Bal uh, Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad, the main link to the North. So all in all, Gilmore was very successful. At the end of the war, he lived in New Orleans for a short time, came back to Baltimore, and I guess to show there was no hard feelings, became police commissioner of Baltimore City. His family did have a lot of wealth and influence, and they hadn't lost that by being Southern sympathizers in the war. Wow. Well, well, thank you very much. Um, now, for the... I'm going to have people ask several questions, so it's easy to, to ask you them right now. Okay. Um, we're here at Jerusalem Mills. Where are we located, and when can people come and visit your museums here? Well, the, the village is located uh, off Route 1. It's right on the baltimore Harford County line in Gunpowder State Park. If you just Google Gunpowder State Park Headquarters, they're right in the middle of the village because the mill of the village is their headquarters. Okay. And we're open on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, different parts of the village. We have a blacksmith shop. We have the mill. It's not an operating mill because that's park headquarters, but we do have the remnants and workings of a mill. Uh, we have the uh, general store that we're in. We have uh, a spring house, a couple spring houses. We also have uh, the Lee family was the main owner and proprietor of the whole village from the late 1770s up until the early 1900s. So their main house is open. Uh, we're doing art exhibits and so forth in there now. Wow, all right. Well, I, th I guess that's about it. Um, incredible amount of knowledge you had, Mr. Glenn, and uh, informing me on, on all of this. And something I'd like to say to everyone, this site's less than three miles from my house. So <laughs> I'm sure you have some kind of a historic site near your home also. So if you can't make it here, try to visit your own local his historic site too. Thank you, Mr. Glenn, and everyone out there, please stay safe, be kind, and be courteous, and visit a historic site near you. Thank you. Well, we thought we closed out the video, but talking to Glenn, the historian. Glenn, take it away. What did we miss in my interview with you? Well, we've been told, and I don't have any actual proof of this, but we've been told that this site, Gilmore's Raid here in Jerusalem Village, is the easternmost raid that took place anywhere during the Civil War. Well, that is a neat little tidbit to add to my video. And uh, there is so much to see here that uh, I hope someone will watch this video and drive out to Jerusalem Mills. And once again, Glenn, thank you for your time you took out to do this video with me. Thank you very much.